Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 128, Gamer Parents. The gaming doesn't have to stop when you have kids. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record these episodes live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, tonight, Deanna is going to join us in the Ask the Bellhop segment as we answer a question from Tabletop Bellhop patron Jeff Seuss and his wife, Sheila, uh, who's been told by many people that having kids will ruin their gaming life. And we're here to tell them that's not necessarily true. Along with that, I thought I'd highlight a game I've been playing with our kids, our much older kids at this point, and that is Dungeons & Dragons Adventure Begins. This is a new D&D board game from Hasbro that is meant to be the fun new intro to Dungeons & Dragons. And finally, I actually have some gaming in on the weekend, so I've got some... Excuse me. <laughs> finally, we've actually got some gaming in on the weekend, and I've got some thoughts on both Machi Coral Bright Lights Big City and the quacks of Quedlinburg, and just a bit more on D&D Adventure Begins. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We've got quite a few comments to get through tonight. It was great to see so much interaction last week. First up, a number of comments on our Legendary Metal Coins unboxing and review. Michael, um, uh, Mikhail, M- Mikhail Simonek writes, Very nice and informative review. Thanks. Julasta commented, great review. It was great to see all the coins in hand and close up. And Max McDougall says, the idea of the potion tokens, I guess, is that you flip it to the non-lacquered side to indicate a spent or empty potion. I may add a few of these to my pledge. Then they later came back to comment, Mm -hmm. my pledge was the four standard metal coin set. And from what I've seen on your two videos, I might end up getting two of the Dwarven Forged set and two of the Forged Dragon set. I will also probably be getting an Adventure Potion set, but I'm not sure what a set consists of in this case, uh, since they do not contain copper, gold, and silver like the others. I'm sure it will be more detailed in the Pledge Manager, but thanks for this review. And followed up with, I just took a look at the comments on the Kickstarter page, and it seems like a set of potions is 12 tokens, six of each red and blue. And we finally, we have a very valid complaint from Sean Cloutier. My only beef with these otherwise amazing coin sets is value. You only get around 25 to 27 coins in one set, which isn't sufficient for almost any tabletop game. Two sets is about right for a typical four-player game, but then you're paying an inordinate amount to upgrade currency compared to other amazing sets like... uh, I'm not sure what that stands for. AOT, WK, Takedo, Scythe, Seven Wonders, and Orleans. Of course, they do have endless variety, which is appreciated for those hard-to-match themes. All right, thanks, everyone, for those comments. Um, AOT, AOT, WK, Attack of the Wookiee Knights. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm not sure what that one is. Okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure either. I was looking at it, the notes, and I'm like, Oh, I probably should have tried to figure out exactly what came to mind. But anyway, sorry. Uh, first up, potion tokens. Well, I, I didn't quite get it during the unboxing. I did mention it in the reviews. I get it now. The blank side's meant to be an empty vial. I think that's fair. I still think, though, they'd be way better if they'd use clear lacquer on the black side and back side instead of leaving like the empty space where the lacquer would go. I do like what Max points out, though, that there is one set of potions isn't just one of each, like I got in the collector set. You do actually get six of each, which makes sense. But then I don't know if the price point's different. You're only getting 12 potions versus 24 coins. So I do hope they're priced lower than a coin set, like they don't take up a coin slot in the pledge manager. But that is something I didn't check. Now, finally, we have Sean's comment that brings up a really good point. Well, Sean the podcaster uh, mentioned the factor in the review you may need multiple sets if playing to replace the coins of a specific game what i never thought to do is actually to compare the cost of buying multiple sets of legendary coins versus picking up someone else's set for the same game right like a third party or a a a a publisher's set 
Um, so Sean, who sent in the comment, is right on the money here, really, because I did that research, and almost every case for a game with a lot of money, it's going to be cheaper to find someone who has created a set of coins for that game rather than trying to upgrade using the legendary metal coins. Like some examples I personally checked was the Lords of Waterdeep because there is a really nice set and Lords of Waterdeep has very unique shaped coins. I looked up Seven Wonders and then I went and checked Stonemire Games because I know Jamie put out a set for Scythe that are put out by him. And they are definitely cheaper than buying multiple sets of legendary metal coins. Now I will say, in most cases, the legendary metal coins are thicker, more detailed, and a little a little shinier, right? Like a little fancier than what are coming in these other sets. But if you're just looking at costs, if you're going to upgrade a specific game, you're probably better off trying to find coins for that game. Either way, it's worth shopping around and looking at what your options are. Yeah, next, a uh, quick comment on our Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons review. Open, learn, play, review gamers playing uh, gamers playing games wrote, okay, I'm almost convinced I just need to watch a playthrough to see it in action. I always happen to have helped someone discover a new game. I, I do wonder if they picked it up. I have to assume that's another podcast or a YouTube channel. Open, learn, play, review gamers. Uh, I'd hope they did check out an AP. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have an AP for that one and probably not one coming anytime soon. Now, the next few comments are on the superhero RPGs we talked about a couple weeks ago. Um, Sean highlighted nine RPGs he's been reading recently and let us know what was different about them. So since Sean was the one, like the, the force behind that topic and it was all his views, I'm going to swap over to reading the comments out and letting Sean respond to them. So first, I got two quick ones. Samuel Kim tweeted, Cry in shame, Mythic Mortals isn't on here. It's light, almost filler RPG that's great to introduce to beginners. And with a little modification, you can really add some depth to it. Highly recommended. Next, Jack Thirsty had a quick comment about Spectaculars. Spectaculars was pretty fun to play through. Now, I've got one more, but it's quite a bit longer. So anything you want to say to these two comments first? Yeah, absolutely. So for uh, Samuel Kim, uh, he, I had never run into Mythic Mortals, and I took a look at it because I was intrigued. And not only is it a unique, very quick-playing supers game, although it's a different kind of supers game, I will say that, but it also <laughs> would have fit in with one of our other episodes not too long ago on games you play with a deck of cards, as uh, the, the entire game is based around play mats that you print out for okay. different character classes and drop down uh, a deck of card, a deck of poker cards, which is your life, but also your abilities. Uh, you draw four cards and place them on your player mat, and uh, the suit determines what uh, power you have in that slot at the time. And then you roll two d six to get underneath the uh, or to get under your under your uh, value to, uh, uh, to to score to win <laughs> not to win to to achieve to, what you need to achieve what you're yeah. trying to do. Yes. Uh, All right. Here's the big one. This well, I just want to mention, from... though, just sorry for Jack. Yeah, I'm glad he enjoyed Spectaculars oh. because I really do think that for a group that likes world development, it's going to be hard to beat. Sorry about that. All right, so this is a big one. This comes from Dirk Van Der Rijken. Uh, he commented on the blog post with this pretty extensive comment. It's getting tiresome to see people criticize crunchier games. m and m isn't even that crunchy and honestly allows far more variation in character options than any of the other games mentioned. Narrative games often encounter a lot of problems, as they generally require a lot of on-the-spot rulings and can easily lead to disagreements because they leave so much vague. Honestly, they've always felt like lazy design work to me. As an acting coach, I also find the statement that narrative games encourage role-playing more than crunchy games completely false. Whether you focus on the role, R-O-L-E, playing aspect, or not depends entirely on the way the DM handles the storytelling and how everyone plays their characters. Also, the disdain for crunchier games has you leave out hero systems, champions, the best of them all, in my opinion, GURP supers, and even older games such as Marvel Phase Rip, DC Heroes, Golden Heroes, Heroes Unlimited, Wild Cards, Godlike, etc. And why not mention better angels, icons, etc.? Well, well, Sean, what do you have to say to that? <laughs> well, there's a lot to unpack there. I guess I'll start off by saying that no one left out anything. 
I picked a few systems I was interested in discussing of the many I have on hand to cover in that brief topic. Uh, we did off camera, in fact, discuss Days Rip. I do have a copy of Icons, and last week we touched on Godlike. Uh, next, I think calling our discussion of crunchier games a criticism is a little bit on, on the unfounded side. It's just not suitable for my particular style of play. Uh, I'm playing online in Discord text only. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sorry to hear you've had poor experiences with narrative games. Though, uh, to be honest, it sounds like some of those problems are more along the realms of players who are used to those rule-complete, crunchier as we call them, systems, and disagreeing out of frustration because they don't have that rule right in front of them. They don't have the answer in print. Narrative games require a cooperative group and not an antagonistic one with a DM versus players, which many of the more crunchy or rules complete systems historically have welcomed or even encouraged. Again, it's not right or wrong, it's just different. As for if narrative does or doesn't encourage more role LE playing, I guess I'm left wondering, if you're not going to use all those stats and charts in, in a crunchy system and instead play a character driven story, why have the crunchy system? All right, I replied to this one myself as well, since it was on the blog. So I did reply to this. And what I pointed out, uh, the most important thing to me here was that this was a subjective list that you, Sean, have been reading. Like the point was to hear about the games from your perspective and not highlight the best super games out there. This wasn't meant to be a definitive list of superhero games or anything of the sort. It wasn't even necessarily supposed to be good superhero games as Sean didn't like some of them. Like this entire topic was Sean's opinion, and he talked about how the games worked or didn't work for him. Nowhere did we claim narrative games are better than crunchier games. Sean just pointed out they work better for him. And I also, I've got to disagree that a narrative game where your powers can literally be right down your power, it can be anything you want, could possibly be more limiting than a crunchy game where you're picking powers off a list. There's no way that list is as powerful as the player's imagination. That's inherently more limiting. Again, though, I'm not trying to imply that one type of game is better than the other. Just that one type was better for Sean. As we've said before, not all games are for everyone, and that is a wonderful thing. Now, finally, we've got a comment on our talk about Indigenous games from last week. This one comes from Nathan V, who writes, Regarding the pronunciation guides, particularly for the more traditional games. It's important to remember that these words come from various phonetic systems that developed independent of the Latin alphabet, not mm. to mention often even independent of each other, depending on where in the Americas they're from. Native American, of course, is not a monoculture. Mm. Any pronunciation that we as na English native speakers are able to read is invariably going to be an approximation of sounds that the Latin alphabet simply isn't able to properly express. I'm not an indigenous person, nor do I pretend to speak for indigenous people. <laughs> however, I would imagine that your efforts to attempt proper pronunciation, however clumsy they may be, are likely more important than actually nailing the precise, precise correct pronunciation. When you make an effort to show respect, it can make otherwise embarrassing mistakes much more forgivable. As you've noticed from both of us in this segment, we're not even that great at pronouncing English sometimes. Pronouncing, see, I, I even, I just did it right there. That was unintentional. Pronouncing English. Uh, thanks for the comment, Nathan. I do hope that it's appreciated that we at least tried. I, we can't do much more than that at this point. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. All right, uh, one thing, exciting thing we want to cover before we get into our main topic. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it this week. We told you all about it last week, and we teased it the week before. Our Terraforming Mars digital giveaway is going strong. I see tweets every day from people who have entered, some people who figured out that you can enter once a day by retweeting the right thing. I see Kevin's name every day, and uh, he's got competition from someone else whose name I don't recognize, where I see their tweets every day, Mikhail. as well as those from strangers. <laughs> Yeah, Mikhail's getting in there regularly. We're not going to spend time on this, but head over to tabletopbellhop.com to enter or follow the link in the show notes. We're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. Tonight we've got a topic, 
topic from one of our awesome Patreon patrons, Jeff Seuss. What tips do you have from when you and Dee first had kids and made sure to keep your gaming hobby alive? How did you make the time with infants and later with toddlers? Context. Many people are either habitual naysayers or have terrible children and tell other people their lives were over at birth. Give us some truth. All right. Thanks for the great comment, Jeff. Uh, I do apologize for taking this long to get to the topic, but we're here now. Now, I'm going to start by saying no. Just because you have kids, that doesn't mean your gaming life is over. But it will change, and it will take some work to keep it going. Now, what we can do for you tonight is to give you some of the tips based on what worked for the two of us. Now, for everyone but Jeff, well, I guess for Jeff's no, Jeff as well, is every family is different, and everyone's kids are different. Along with that, people have different gaming groups that may or may not be willing to go along with some of the stuff we're going to suggest tonight. We happen to have a good group of friends we game with that are very um, accommodating and, and willing to, to put up with things that, that others may not be willing to. Now, the other thing I do think is also important to note is that Deanna and I are both gamers, have been lifelong gamers. We met through gaming, as well as being parents. And I know this would also be the case for Jeff and Sheila. They do game together as well. But I also realize it's very common for gamers to be with non-gaming spouses. And that's a totally different situation, which is going to make things more difficult, as Sean well knows. Indeed, I gamed very little before I had kids, as my wife isn't a gamer but once we had kids more games started getting to the table as even if they were kids games they were still games well except for candyland they were activities where the kids <laughs> learned and you played together all right uh we're probably going to give deanna the mic most of the night she's got the best experiences here she's got everything down here so what we're going to do is i think start off with uh dealing with newborns Okay, well, you have to expect to put things on a pause for a little bit because newborns are a pain. They're time-consuming. They're going to take up your whole life, right? And when someone in your gaming group has a new baby, you have to expect that they're going to go AWOL for a little while. Um, but once a baby's a month or two old, you might want to start making inquiries and see if there are ways you can accommodate them to help them start playing again. Um, some folks might want to jump back in, and some might want to wait until their infants are a little older. So that's from the opposite perspective. That's if you have a, a gamer parent in your group. Right. Right. So if, if someone in your group has kids, don't expect things to go on as they have. There's There are obviously going to be some changes. And please don't pressure them to come back. Make it their decision. Do not, like, realize that having a baby is a life-changing event. It doesn't have to ruin your life, as some people are wont to point out, but it is life-changing. And your gaming group needs to be flexible. And we had one fellow in our group who was a single parent, and he would get a sitter just to come out and game with us, which was cool. But we had to expect that there were weeks when the sitter canceled, his kid was sick. Like, he missed a lot more than other people in our group, right? And we had to be ex able to um, be accepting of that, right? Um, you telling me I have to be loud enough made me lose my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, no, absolutely. And it's, there's definitely there's definitely a lot of, of interplay, right? The, the key thing is the flexibility where you need to understand that everything's going to be in flux constantly. Yes. Uh, when it comes to jumping back into things, um, how that pregnancy played out is going to have a huge uh, impact on when you start again. Some mm -hmm. women are... are you know, have a wonderful pregnancy and everything goes well and they come home from the hospital and three days later they're perky. And I'm sure mm -hmm. there's a, many women out there who want to kill them, but there's <laughs> also women who come home and struggle because new children are new and there are issues with postpartum depression and there are physical issues that, occur, that can occur during childbirth. That, you know, no one needs to go into all that, but how fast you can recover and be a human again after uh, pregnancy is, is variable enough, let alone how fast you're willing to come back to a group of people uh, yes. and, right. and interact with those people. And for guys, too. Like, it's an adjustment. Yeah. That's one thing I did want to point out. Please do not do the archaic thing that the guy doesn't have to be involved. And just because the wife had – just because your wife's pregnant and you had a kid doesn't mean you can't come out. Come on, Johnny. Let's go out and play. That's that's a dated concept. The men have a huge role to play, especially in early development in child. And again, expect that both parents, uh, it doesn't even necessarily be a man or a woman, both parents 
may have an adjustment period and may not be able to join back with your group right away. Yeah, that's just be fair. This goes for adopting too. You may yeah. not have the physical impediments of giving birth, but in some ways that's even more life changing because if you're pregnant for nine months, you're getting used to things. Whereas if you've adopted, it's a little bit more bang. There you go. A surprise. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we were talking about when the one fall in our group would get a babysitter and that's nice and all, but if I had a babysitter when my kids were babies, I didn't want to get together and go gaming. I wanted to go out on the town, like, cause it didn't happen that often. <laughs> so <laughs> for me, the way to keep gaming going was to have it in our house, you know, have it on the home turf. So, um, I mean, when it comes to playing at public play events, sometimes it's not going to be possible for both parents to take part and mm -hmm. you can swap off and who gets to go to the friendly local game store and who stays home. Right. And for me, most of the time I sent Mo off to play because I didn't care as much. I'm kind of a homebody and I'd, I'd rather be playing at home than at public events, right? So I'm like, eh. But, I mean, you do whatever works for you and your partner and you... Yeah, and um, make, make sure you talk to each other and, and communicate and, uh, you know, find out. Make, you know, if one of you doesn't really care that much about going to the, the FLGS, that's fine. But don't assume that maybe because that person didn't previously want to go to the go play the public play events all they still don't they might really want to get out of the house mm -hmm. <laughs> they might That's really need that break to be around adults yeah. for two hours a week that they might not otherwise be getting so even if they aren't regularly that go to the uh, public play events gamers they mm -hmm. might become one after you know big events just in order to again be with other adults, which can be a big thing sometimes, yes. depending on, on your, your social situation as a new parent. One of the things to note, though, obviously, is uh, this is going to depend a lot on your support structure at home. If you have babysitters, if you have family that can watch the kids, unfortunately, I know there are a number of people out there that are they're stuck is not the proper word. I don't want to say they're stuck with their kids, but they don't have someone else that can watch the kids. Yeah, we never so have. Gaming at their place may be the only option. Yeah, we've never had we've never had sitters. We don't have family in the city that can yeah. babysit for us. So you play at the house of the ones with the kids or the youngest kids. I mean, that's a it's a not a bad rule of thumb. And um, I mean, when my kids were little, I didn't want to bring them somewhere else and then game because I wanted to be. Keep, I felt like I needed to be keeping an eye on them, and then I can't do something immersive like gaming. That's not fun. That's just stressful. Right. Right. So. So with really young kids, we used to play with uh, the daughter sitting on the table in her, her oh, yeah. bassinet when, or when whatever. She was in, like newborn infants are malleable little creatures that just want to be wherever you are. So, I mean, even you were talking about, Jeff, about some children being really terrible. Like even our second daughter, she was miserable and colicky. But I remember wearing her in a baby sling and just pacing up and down um in the basement while role playing because yeah. she wouldn't cry if i was walking with her right i just couldn't set her down <laughs> like and um, one of the rules in our game group at the time was you're gonna have to put up with the inner breastfeeding yeah no if, if you weren't just, comfortable with that if you weren't comfortable with that in my house you weren't so welcome like, yeah because <laughs> she's like I, the kid's hungry i'm gonna feed it so that again is up to your own personal comfort level but again that's where you need to talk to your group right you need to you need to communicate with them and make sure they're good with it but that is a great way to keep gaming especially with a toddler right or sorry uh, an infant an before infant, they yeah. be, before they the, when they're super needy but in a different type of not mom 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 needy yeah when they're when they're first born most of the time you keep them up against you and it, yeah. you know if if you're lucky they will sleep a lot. Some of them, not yes. so much. There's, there's, there's a wide variety. But, uh, yes. uh, I, you know, for us, our first one slept like a baby, for, <laughs> for, yeah. for lack of a better term, all the time. Uh, and then our second was the one that, uh, that didn't sleep as much. But yep. uh, we were really lucky with the first one. And uh, we could have done all the gaming we wanted at the time. And to be honest, I when it first started, I'm like, we're never gonna have to stop gaming. This is awesome. And then you hit a period where it did become an issue. Like when they when they were infants, it was working really well. We're like, wow, all right. And then they got a little older, and it, it's a little more titchy. It's 
it's I think the most important thing is you set up the expectations with your game group. I mean, if they know they're showing up at at your house and you're going to have an infant there and you're going to have a baby in the room with you or you're going to be taking breaks to take care of kids and they know it ahead of time, that's you know, it, it's like any gaming contract, right? Just setting yep. up expectations ahead of time and also setting up expectations between you and your partner so you're not breaking down and having an argument over whose turn it is to get the bottle in the middle of game night because that's no fun. Uh, the other thing too is um, I think normalize it. If you're going to be gaming with your kids, one of the things you need to do is normalize it at a young age. So like our kids grew up talking about the role-playing friends. The role-playing friends were people that came over once a week. The kids didn't know what a week was at that point, but nope. came over now and then. And they'd often be like at dinner, oh, the role-playing friends coming over tonight. So it was normalized. It was just part of their day-to-day -day that now and then mom and dad sat and played games. And um, at first, well, mostly they went to bed early enough. It wasn't a problem. But we'd set them up on the TV or they, they'd watch Zabumafu on DVD or whatever. We'd set up something for them to watch and we'd play. And sure enough, they'd interrupt now and then. But it was it was part of regular life. It wasn't a, it was never a big event. It was like, oh, we're gaming tonight. It was like, yeah, yeah, it's Monday night. The, the role-playing friends are coming over. Yes. And I mean, if we had wanted to play in the middle of the day, that might have been more problematic. Yeah. But we would do it later in the evenings. They'd um, Once they were like, you know, preschoolers, they'd be up for a couple hours. I would keep something exciting and rare that they didn't normally get to do like a special tv show or something that they really wanted to watch and they're like our basement is set up that they're kind of in the same room with us but off to the side and they'd watch that and then we'd have to pause and one of us would take them upstairs to bed and then we'd come back downstairs and keep gaming and you know thankfully our group was accepting of that but yeah. again they knew you know i'm going to disappear for 20 minutes and take the kids upstairs and i'll be back right so yeah setting up the expectations again is 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 really important not only for the, for the group but for the kids as well, yeah. right? You need to, they need to understand that this is happening and what's happening. And, and maybe they know that they're getting something out of it, right? Maybe they're, they're getting that show that they never get to see another time or they're getting to stay up a little bit later or something. But, you know, they have to learn the expectations from a very early age, as soon as they're able to start interacting about, you know, the difference between normal time when you can just come up and, and, and grab mommy or daddy's arm and, and, demand something at any time versus when the people are over and you need to, you know, sort of stand back and, and wave if you need something and mm -hmm. wait to be acknowledged. Oh, and I will say um, when they were infants, like newborns and for, you know, for that first six months to a year area there, it was much easier to play role-playing games than it was to play board games. Cause a right. role-playing game, you can just come in and out of the narrative. If I need to walk out of the room, it's not a huge issue you know mm -hmm. as opposed to having to make everyone stop and wait for my turn so that i can you know move my meeple around is is another thing entirely right so all right we went a little off script so <laughs> i told you i just talk i know it's good i'm just trying <laughs> yeah. to figure out if i need to scroll the notes or not um <laughs> yeah let's see so again with the with the board game versus role-playing thing the other concern you always have to keep in mind is board games especially have adult hobby board games are not meant for children and toddlers. Yeah. Uh, there's a reason why those age limits are on there. And most of it has to do with all those really awesome, shiny things that you can put in your mouth. Yes. Um, so again, you know, depending on the age and, and, you know, if they're, if they're sitting in their bassinet on the table next to you and you can rock the bassinet while you're playing, great. You can, you can play with all the little tiny pieces you want, but if they are, you know, in your arms and mm -hmm. have reaching ability, you might mm -hmm. not want to be playing Gloomhaven where they can get their hands on yeah. all sorts of fun little tokens and, and things. Speaking of which, here's a totally different, I'm not perspective on that, but something else to consider. You may need to rearrange your game room. This is something I personally had to do. I had to move all the miniatures up much higher. I had to move all the, mm -hmm. I have like potion bottles and like anyone who's seen my game room knows there's a bunch of stuff on the shelves. My, my game room is basically set up like a bunch of wizard shelves. Bladed things, yes. bayonets. They yes, bayonets. Storage. My kids still haven't seen those actually. <laughs> yes, the bayonets. I, yes, I have a small collection of bayonets and I have like some knives and stuff because, you know, I used to go to Renaissance festivals and stuff. Uh, the bayonets actually World War One. But anyway, yeah, those all went away um, and haven't come back out. Everything got moved up, right? Like everything shifted upwards out of little toddler reach. And I've got to say, holy cow, have our kids been awesome with that the whole time. We have never had a problem with um, them like getting into my stuff. For a very long time, they weren't allowed in the basement by themselves. And they just yeah. knew that. 
right? And there was yeah, uh, but they didn't even sneak down there. Nope. Like I know me as a kid, I would have been planning I, all that and trying yes, to put it back exactly. in the exact same spot so Dad wouldn't notice. Yep. Um. Yeah. So I, I mean, some people really enjoy playing with their toddlers at the table. Personally, I didn't. Uh, that depends on your personal, you know, like I, I've seen a lot of people that take enjoyment of having their toddler at the table and having them maybe move the meeple for them or roll some dice or whatever. Yeah. And depending on your kid's personality and patience level, that can work as a way to get some gaming in. It's just, I didn't find that to be fun. Um, I don't, I mean, and that's totally separate from sitting and playing games with your kids, which is fun. Um, and, you know, as they get older, there's lots of decent toddler and preschooler board games out there, which we have definitely covered on other. So, yes, I mean, we have lots of podcasts out there. Go to the blog, search children, kids game, any of those. We'll throw some links to a few of them in, uh, in the podcast show notes. Playing with toddlers, we've covered all of that before. I think that's it like my my biggest tips are that you need to be flexible you need to have an accommodating game group and that's about it yeah so part of it it's going to really depend on the kids right their their patience level their personality and the 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 um comfort level of your group right um one of the things you kind of skipped over earlier and kind of mentioned is you should be going to the parents house like don't insist someone come to your place if they're the ones with the parent because you probably don't have all the things that child might need on hand, whereas the parents would. And maybe you haven't moved everything three shelves up. And yes, I was going to say your house might not be as child safe and so on. So child proofing is a a significant and time consuming uh, event (laughs) an ongoing uh, event. So yeah. So I would recommend like, like offer it up. Like I like you should put that forth. If it's not you, this frightening or, or had the, had the child, Offer to go to that person. So, hey, you know what? If you want to keep gaming, how about we play at your house? I'll keep the M and I'll bring all my books, whatever the case may be. Now, if they say, no, 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 I'll still come over. That's fine. But then warn them, right? Like, hey, my place might not be child safe. And, you know, I've got a really expensive game table and I wouldn't be happy if your kid puked on it. Like, like I, I realize it's not easy to say, but it's kind of true, right? Like, this is not a cheap hobby. When we're talking hobby board games, we're not talking about ruining a $10 copy of Monopoly if, if a kid throws up on it or gets poop everywhere or whatever, right? And so that is something that should consider. It should be considered. And as a parent, realize this, right? Because you do, like Dana used to call it mommy brain. Sometimes you're not, you're not quite thinking yeah. straight. Oh, definitely. You, get, you don't sleep for, you know, a couple of years. You get a little foggy. So, so don't also don't expect as a parent for people to accommodate you just because you have a kid doesn't mean people should bend over because you have a kid. Yes. Our society in general, we treat especially young parents and, and parents with young children a little differently, but there's no preset rule that your game group has to let you bring your kid or something like that. Again, that's all that expectation. Talk about it. There, there, there should be a, a session zero, I guess, for, for your group, right? Get together and say, Hey, we're going to have a kid. It's, they're coming around this time. We're probably going to be off a couple weeks. We would like to keep gaming if we can. Here's some ways we thought to do that. It, what do you think? It evolved. Like, I didn't know that I was just going to be like, I'm breastfeeding. You all can deal with it. I didn't know that was going to happen until I was in the hospital. And, like, everyone, including the janitor, is walking into your room. And I'm like, all right, apparently I just got to get over this. So, I mean, it, ad- it it evolved, right? Like, And we didn't know what it was going to be like. Being a new parent is, yeah. it's you know, you're diving in. And by the time we got to the second kid, it was like, here, keep your sister busy. Go watch TV. We're, we're gaming. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you do, not at you, first. Yeah, Actually, not this, at first. You talk, the second pregnancy was rough. Yes. I for I you, you were for a, a for a long time. Yeah. Yes. So then the other thing you can do, too, is once your kids start getting older, is they you can game with them, right? So we mentioned lots of different toddler games. So one of the great compromises is, for one, if your game group's cool with it, play with everyone, right? Like, get them to the table. Not every week. Point out that this is special. We're not going to do this every Monday. But you know what? Tonight, you get to play with the role-playing friends. And, like, we did that on, like, birthdays and New Year's and mm-hmm, stuff like yeah. that. But that's great. But, again, get your group's permission. Don't just show up to, you know... Twilight Imperium, you got a 12-hour game night planned with a toddler. Don't do that to your your friends. Okay, it ahead of time. Um, but the other thing you can do is uh, the, the, the kid compromise, right? The Well, tonight, mom and dad are going to be playing with role-playing friends, but how about tomorrow, we'll sit down and we'll play Laundry Jumble or whatever toddler game your kids are into, or we'll play Candyland, right? So you get that, that reward, or even better, if you can do it in the same day. Right, because then you get the game table and everything set up and clean, and you play with the kids. And then when the kids show head off the bed, the gamers can come in and start playing. 
And that that works really well for us on yeah. on events like New Year's and stuff because we'd only do it a couple times a year, right? So. Yeah. Now the other thing we've recommended to is play with the play in the evenings, right? My, most kids have fairly young bedtimes. Our our little little ones had seven thirty at the time, so we didn't start gaming till eight. And thankfully, it wasn't that disruptive. Everyone showing up because I was worried about that at first that you know the kids wouldn't get to sleep because they keep hearing people coming the house. Mm-hmm. Well, they got used to it, right? But they they got knew used people to it. were Again, coming over. You know, kids et kids are it really good. Who's at the door? Is Santa here? Yeah. <laughs> Kids are really good at getting used to things. That's one thing yeah. that a lot of people don't understand is kids become accustomed to what is going on around them. So mm-hmm. if you game game at the house all the time, kids just accept that as normal. Uh, they will start asking their friends why you know when their when their parents' gaming friends are going to come over because they accept that as normal. Uh, one thing to mention though is about the play in the evenings. Uh, while many kids and I think most parents we'll hope that their kids do the nighttime sleeping thing. That's not always the case. Yes. Some kids do have some pretty messed up sleep schedules and it takes time and a lot of effort to get those switched around sometimes. So make sure you're aware of what that the parent involved sleep children's sleep schedule is. Yes. Don't just assume that, Oh, you've got a newborn. Well, they're going to go to bed and stay and you know, sleep for 12 hours. I, I was more thinking at toddler level. At this yeah. point. When they were toddlers, we were playing downstairs with a baby monitor. And I, sometimes we'd have to, one of us would have to run upstairs. Uh, as they got older, we'd have kids just popping up downstairs. And I, I would like literally beg them. I'm like, you just have to be clothed because they like sleeping on church. I'm like, please, the role playing friends are over. Just put clothes on before you come downstairs. Um, yeah. You know, they come downstairs, we'd hear terrible noises, uh, whatever, we'd have to pause the game, right? So, um, again, our group was very accommodating for that, yeah. so it worked. So I think overall, set expectations all around, um, between the partners, the parents, who whose turn is it to do what, and who's going to take, one of the, if the monitor goes off, who goes and takes care of it, let the group know what's going to happen, let the kids know. Don't t- include the children in this, right? Let, let them know what's coming. Like even very small children can grasp a lot of these concepts. Yep. And even, even if they may not seem like they understand you. Um, the other thing that will help is keeping it regular. Um, game night shouldn't be a surprise. Like people just showing up at the house is going to be way more disturbing as then everyone comes over on eight o'clock on a Monday. Yep. Yep. So regular scheduling, but that also goes with trying to maintain your game group. And it's another one of our big suggestions to not have your game group fall apart is to try to get together and do something every week. And that's another thing is once you have kids involved, things will go wrong. Be prepared to maybe just chill and hang out and watch the kids play video games and have some coffees because it's just not going to work that night. Like or sometimes I had to say, you guys go ahead. I give up. I'm just going to be upstairs because yeah. this is not working. So it, it be accommodating on both sides, whether you're the parent or the game group. Yeah. And if you're, if you are doing an RPG in particular, make sure that you're not, you've, you've got um, allowances built in, right? If, if, mm-hmm. if a, if one of the parents is going to have to step away for the night because their kid has is colicky or just you know some can't can't settle down don't penalize that player because of Mm -hmm. having to miss out you know they make make allowances for that and know that you're going to need to make allowances sometimes uh you shouldn't be penalizing them because one they're being penalized by not being there with the group and playing Mm -hmm. uh don't add you know insult to injury so the chat I see has been asking a lot for, for older kids and toddlers and what to do with interruptions. And again, I think it's, it's mostly set the expectations, but as the kids get older, include them more. Whether that's help, have them help you clean up for game night and sweep the floor and then play a game with them before people show up. Um, involve them in games if possible, right? Like set it up so that like my kids are old enough to run RPGs. If, if our Monday night green group was going, I would love Gwen to run a game of uh Tales of Equestria for everyone one week or something, right? Like, as they, they can now stay up as late as we play, uh, not on a regular night, but, like, on a weekend or something like that. Um, but our kids are now 11 and 13. Yeah, so they're not toddlers. Toddlers different. is different, yeah. Um, like I said, try to involve them more. Um, distraction is a big thing, like, like Deanna had mentioned. Have some kind of reward for it. Make sure it's regular. By the time their toddlers are starting to get understand rhythms better in weeks and when it's a weekend and when it's busy time and when they should be quiet and when they shouldn't. Um, but you're going to have to deal with tantrums. Like uh, both our kids went through a period where they just didn't stop. 
It oh. happens. And, and you know what? If you have to cancel gaming for a few weeks, while while the kids um, what is stretch their freedoms? I think <laughs> is a uh, try 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 to gain control over their own lives in whatever way they can. I think is that's that's what they're actually doing at that age is what is trying to uh, set boundaries and expectations while they're going through that stage, which will happen. You might not be gaming for that little while, or maybe that's the perfect time where it's okay. You get a week off, I get a week off, and we're going to go game at Mike's place where there are no kids. Just send them to live at my mom's for yeah, two weeks. Send them to my my or the grandparents. The other, right. The other thing to watch out for: we talked about distractions and you know you know having something special before gaming night. Uh, make sure you don't go too special. If you set their expectations too high, they're going to expect that. Um, yeah. And so you don't want to necessarily have to be going out and buying a brand new. Oh, goodness, deck of Pokemon no. cards every week just yeah. so that you can play the game or something. You know, My it can just, just be t- screen time. Yeah, they didn't have a lot of screen time. So they were pretty, like now in the pandemic, it's gotten a little out of hand, but they didn't used to get a lot of screen time. So they were pretty happy. It was like novel to be able to come downstairs and watch TV and kind of listen in on what we were doing. Yeah, you were. know, like the whole thing, right? They were excited about it. So, which is something I also feel to mention, I should mention, though, we didn't care. Um, you might want to warn your group to uh, change their vocabulary, their language, and what happens in the games based on the kids being around. Now, us with our kids, I didn't worry about it. We never have. Uh, we've sworn around the kids since <laughs> D. As, as I'm still shocked. We've gone almost a full episode here without any swearing. I've um, been very good. <laughs> she's been very good. Um, and you know what? Our kids don't swear at all. Like So it's not like we taught them bad habits or whatever. We It's just something... I think I first read that Kevin Smith did that, and I was like, you know what? It's language. Like, like it's it's ways to express certain emotions that are difficult to express otherwise, and whatever. And we went with it, but that might not certain be for everyone. Topic matters would not yes, be appropriate that's in front of my kids, and I would probably put a kibosh on it pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, X card, X card can care. matter for X card I've can read be used out for lots loud. Of Yes. all sorts of curious content to my daughters when they were very young infants just want to hear voices so yes. it, that doesn't matter at that point but yeah once once they get the school age and so on once once they're paying more attention plus realize they are paying attention uh it's it's shocking stuff you hear about a month later or whatever now and then but like we were playing fantasy games like uh, we were playing warhammer uh but it was you know it was pure fantasy it was dwarves fighting goblins and and dwarves being silly and drunken and yeah. and it, it was we were we were not playing any heavy bleed games uh, while we had the kids around. No. Uh, I we see. Uh, D&D, actually, people talking about uh, once the kids get are getting are getting to that older age, the kids get involved in things. You've got yes. soccer and t ball and karate and uh, scouts and all these little things, and that can become uh, something as well. And again, that comes back to flexibility and. Mm-hmm. Usually, parents are going to try and find one day of the week where they don't have to have their kids yes. at all the different places. Uh, and maybe that also becomes the gaming uh, day, you know. But again, we're going to stay at home. We're not going to bring our kids anywhere. So you guys come here and play a game. It mm-hmm. can be a great solution to that because those parents want interaction that isn't with all the other parents in the, you know, waiting room at karate or whatever it might yes. be. Yeah, kids' events may be a chance for you to game, but I know most parents like to hang around for like like longer events, sporting events, or whatever. Yeah. Personally, I'm thinking if I if I got to drop my kids off at T-ball, I would drop them off and be like, "Hey, we got two and a half hours. Let's get into some gaming." <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for our discussion on continuing to game once you have kids. We're gonna head over to the lobby and see if any other. Uh, anyone else in our chat room has questions or further discussions that we can talk about. Today we're going to take a look at Dungeons and Dragons Adventure Begins, a cooperative board game. To start, what exactly is D&D Adventure Begins? Is it a board game? An RPG? What do you get in this box? All right, so Dungeons and Dragons Adventure Begins is a board game with RPG elements that was published by Hasbro in late 2020. It's hit store shelves around October. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't find any credit on this box for who designed the game, though I do know that Ali Jennings worked on it, but there was probably a 
larger group of people who were involved. Uh, thanks, Hasbro, for not even giving credit to the people who designed the game. Um, it does feature artwork from Heading Ludvigsen and Benjamin Rhino. Now, this D&D themed game has a retail price of $24.99, and I would suggest shopping around because I have seen it significantly cheaper than that. Now, it's listed as a two to four player game with each session taking anywhere from honestly half an hour, maybe even 15 minutes to an hour to an hour and a half, really depending on how involved your group gets, how descriptive you get, and whether or not you take part in optional side quests when you're playing. I personally don't see why you couldn't play this game solo. Now, you're going to miss out on the shared storytelling aspects, but mechanically, you could definitely play it solo. And if you're the type of person that enjoys telling stories by yourself, I think you'd have a ton of fun playing with this on your own. Now, in Adventure Begins, the cooperative Dungeons & Dragons board game, you're going to pick one of four big baddies to fight. These are iconic D&D monsters. You're going to set up a map, and each round, you're going to travel down the map towards the big baddie. At each space, your group is going to have some kind of encounter. Note, these aren't all combats. It's just a different type of encounter. Now, the dungeon master role, the, the role of moderator, isn't one player in this, like a standard D&D game. Instead, it swaps every turn, and you just pass it to the left. And encounters are determined by the draw of a card based on what map tile you're on. Now, after completing an encounter, the group will earn gold and or items. With enough gold, the group can purchase more items or level up. At certain parts along the path, you also have the option to do side quests. Now, side quests in this particular game are always combat encounters, and it's basically a way to, if you don't think you're equipped off enough or you need some more gold before the final fight, you're going to want to do some side quests. Now, that end goal is to defeat the big bad. Now, while playing the game, there are going to be multiple instances where the players are prompted to tell a story. Now, this storytelling is a pure improv experience. There are no rules for what type of story to tell. There's not even any real guidelines. Interestingly, while this does add a very solid role play acts element to Adventure Begins, none of this improvising actually has any effect on the mechanics. More about that, quite a bit more about that actually later. Now, the best way to see most of what you get for in the box for this game is to check out our Dungeons & Dragons Adventure Begins unboxing video on YouTube. All right. So, component-wise, um, I, eh, I, I was kind of unimpressed overall by what you get in here. And not just because uh, I didn't get everything I should have in my box, as Sean just hinted at. Um, the box comes with a service of molded plastic insert. And I like it as long as you store your games flat. If you store your games vertically, it's a piece of garbage. Keeping them flat like I do, I was happy about it. But the kids, I gave this game and they put it on their shelf and I took it off their shelf and that was a mess. Um, there are a number of punch boards, as you expect in most modern games. These were not easy to punch. Uh, they were definitely not falling off the sprues. So I actually had some difficulty getting some of them punched with some, um, I always want to call them taggies. I don't know the proper term for where you get a little bit of cardboard sticking off the off the, uh, the token. Now, these punch boards contain the four map boards, which are single-sided, which was a bit of a disappointment. It just seemed like, why not give you twice as many maps? A bunch of tiles used to create characters and some small round gold tokens. The rest is, uh, not the rest of the components, but the, the next thing you're going to find is a bunch of cards split over multiple decks. There are also four trays for holding your character tiles. Um, these are like a base of a DM screen is probably the best way I could describe them without showing it to you. There's a DM tray, so a little tray you pass around to whoever's being the dungeon master. There's a hit point tracking clip that is used for the monsters, and it's two-sided. There's one black D10 and four D20s in the four colors for the game, and hopefully four miniatures. Unfortunately, my copy of the game was missing the green elf miniature, which Hasbro was unwilling to replace. Again, more about that later. Now, I was a little confused by these miniatures, of all things, because Wizards of the Coast publishes Dungeons & Dragons. They have a line of pre-painted plastic miniatures that aren't overly expensive. These miniatures in this game do not come from that line. These are like hard, um, I don't know, they're not as tall as army men. Like they're a hard plastic. They feel like a board game piece, not a detailed miniature. And they actually do have less detail than the, the, the official D&D miniatures. And they're most definitely not pre-painted. 
So to me, that was just a really odd choice. Like if you have a game that says Dungeons and Dragons, there's Dungeons and Dragons miniatures out there. Why wouldn't you even cross promote? Like even have a flyer in there that says, hey, the miniatures in this game come from, I don't know. To me, that was a missed opportunity. Overall component quality is decent. All the plastic stuff's nice. The dice are standard dice. The miniatures are serviceable. Uh, I did like the design they did for the character stand. So I, I kind of tried to describe this. It's like a stand and it has a spot to track your hit points on the bottom and a plastic slider that goes up and down on it. And you're going to slide cards into it to make basically like a, a, a DM screen for a player. You make like a player screen. Those are really nice. I did like that aspect. Um, and I, I love having that slider to track your hit points. Yeah, and it's not just a slider you slip on a card, which, are, of course, are notoriously problematic in games. Well, about that. So, well, the player's hit point trackers are plastic sliders on their character stand. The monster hit points are all tracked with a clip. Uh, it's a two-sided clip, one that's for sliding onto cards, so your encounter cards. And then the other side of it is for sliding onto cardboard, which is the boss standees. I will say, so far, the clip has worked really well. It hasn't damaged any of the cards. It's been easy to move, um, even with my youngest daughter doing it, who can be a little clumsier. And I got to say, it's much better than certain other Hasbro-owned Avalon Hill published games that won't be mentioned here. Okay, so now that we know the premise of the game and what you should get in the box, how about letting us know how you play the game? So, as noted earlier, first thing you do is pick a baddie to fight. Who's the big boss you're going to take on? This box includes four different story arcs you can play through, each which is based on a different traditional D&D threat. These fearsome foes include Felbris the Beholder, Orn the Fire Giant, Deathsleep the Green Dragon, and the Dreaded Kraken. No Tiamat? How disappointing. <laughs> well, see... They actually stuck to canon here in a way because this game is set in the Forgotten Realms. And these are all named bad guys from that setting from various modules over the years. And while Tiamat is actually a Greyhawk baddie, not from the realms, though they did kind of steal Tiamat and turn it into the Kisses for Dragonlance. So they actually stuck to canon here. Now, each of these monsters is associated with one of the four boards, the four maps. The monster standee goes at the end of that board. You then build the rest of the map by randomizing the other boards and connecting them in a row. You end up with a series of four of them. Now, at the end of each map, you're going to place henchman cards. So every boss monster comes with three henchman cards. So you're going to put one at the end of every other one. So at the end of map one is henchman card one, end of map two, henchman card three, and so on. You're then going to shuffle the item deck and put it next to the board. You're going to put the gold coins where everyone can reach them. The D&D tray, or sorry, D&D, the DM tray is readied by taking the cards for the first map board and shuffling it and putting it into that tray. And then you're also going to put the D10 and the HP tracker on that for the DM to use. So certainly a quick and easy kid-friendly mm -hmm. setup. One pro tip, though, is don't just start playing because each of the monsters tells a story. And these are epic, good D&D &D stories. Like the Beholder has taken over the dwarven city of Gauntlet Grim, has caused all of the dwarves to fall asleep, and their nightmares are raging through the town. If you just set up the Beholder and say, okay, let's play, you're missing out on that story. So now that you've got everything set up, everyone has to make a character. So this is pretty traditional for role-playing games like D&D. &D. But it's done very uniquely. There's no die rolling or anything like that. There's no character sheet. So what you're going to do is pick one of the four colors in the game. And you're going to take all the cardboard tiles of that color. And there are six of them for each of the character classes. And there might be more than six. There's more than one, two, three, four. There are... Now, I don't know. There's four different two-sided. So there's eight possible combinations here. So you're going to take your four tiles... They're all two-sided. The first tile you're going to look at is your character's name, race, and class. This is your hero tile. Now, there are male and female presenting options for each character. No, it doesn't specifically call out the gender. It's just the way they look. Uh, these include an elf bard, a dwarf fighter, a dragonborn rogue, and a human sorcerer. Now, the back of the book gives you details on what this means for anyone who's not familiar with D&D &D, and tells you how you should roleplay these characters based on who you pick. Next up, you're going to pick a personality. Now, this tile gives some role-playing prompts, so it tells you three different prompts for what your character should act like, as well as a special ability. Finally, you're going to select one of two combat tiles. Now, this tile determines what attacks you have. So, what, what not necessarily weapons, what weapons or spells or abilities you have. Now, you're going to pick one of the two tiles and put it on the level one side. Later on in the game, when you level up, you get to use the other side. 
now you're going to take all three of these tiles and slide it into that plastic tray. And like I said, with it facing you, it kind of makes like this DM screen. And as mentioned earlier, you have a setting to track your hit points, so you're going to set those to 10. Now, here's a big change from D&D. Everyone starts at 10. It doesn't matter what race, class, ability. Everyone's got 10 hit points in this. Now, the last thing is to pick a backpack. There are a number of these included in the box. Each which has like a title, like the Adventurer's Backpack or the Explorer's Backpack or the, the, the Pickpocket's Backpack. And it has four items listed on that backpack. So everyone's got a unique backpack. So I'd like to give a small cheer for the fact that there are no racial or gender bonuses or negatives championed here in this yeah. game. Now, once you're done creating your character, you're going to place the miniature for your character on the first spot of the first board, furthest from the big boss, and begin your first encounter. Now, encounters in D&D Adventure Begins are all card-driven. The currently active DM will take the top card from the tray and place it on the holder so that they can see the back of it and all the other players can see the front, see the artwork. Then they're going to read off the back of the card and play out that encounter. Now, each deck does feature both combat and non-combat encounters, and actually the ratio of each depends on what part of the board you're in. So when you're in the city, there's actually more uh, non-combat encounters, but when you're in the volcanic underground with lots of elementals, there's more combat encounters. And see, this is a great feature and a way to identify young barbarians in training early on and <laughs> perhaps guide them down a more balanced path. Now I'm going to start off by describing a non-combat encounter. So what it's going to do is it's going to present the group with some situation to react to. And the DM is going to read this off the card to the, the other players. Now, this could be an obstacle to overcome, uh, someone they met along the way, an item they've discovered, uh, an opportunity they could take advantage of. Like, you see a glint in a lake. Do you do any, like, do you go try to get it? Now, the DM role will present this by reading the back of the card. Then all the players, including the one acting as DM, will decide how to respond. So, which on the surface, so far sounds great, encouraging group collaboration and improvisation. Now, some encounters will provide choices instead. So, like a which way. It'll be, you have to do this or that. Now, in all cases, as Sean just said, this does encourage improvisation. The game encourages you to role play while doing this. Now, the outcome will be based on which option on the cards pick, though. So, if you decide to do this or this, you're just going to get whatever the card says. There, there's no rulings being made here by the DM. Other encounters will have the group come up with a solution on their own. So instead of everyone deciding this or that, you're all going to be like, all right, the, you're on a bridge and the rope starts snapping. What do you each do? And then everyone is going to describe what they do. And again, role-playing is encouraged. And the game suggests the stuff you already have. So your personality traits, your weapons, and the stuff in your backpack all to be used to come up with how your characters react. The result is then determined by having one player roll a d20 for that result. Sorry, this is everyone's responding on their own. Sorry, each player will roll a d20, and the DM will look at their card and then read off what the specific result is. Now, the final top of, type of encounter will have the group react to something. It's suddenly the bridge ahead is washed out. How do you find a way to get across? And everyone will work together to come up with a solution. And everyone is encouraged to, again, use their personality traits, their race and class, their items to describe what they do to help get across this water. And then one player will make the roll. And the way we played it, we always went with whoever came up with the best plan, made the die roll, but it could be anyone. Now, in all cases, the results are driven by die rolls and what's on the card. Again, there are no DM rulings. There's no interpretation. There's no having to come up with a response. It's everyone tells you what they're going to do, and then you roll the dice. And this mechanical aspect is where the problem in this game lies. It's very clearly showing the kids that whatever role play you do, doesn't matter. Whatever the dice says happens. And that's exactly what it's like. And then combat is similar, though a bit more complicated. Um, one of the rules we actually missed the first time we played is there is an initiative rule. So when an encounter starts off, the DM's going to take the card, it's going to put it in the front, everyone's going to get to see the monster. Um, they're going to read the short monster description. Note it's short. Like, there's this is not a big, this is not read the box text from a D&D adventure. Then everyone rolls initiative. Simple D20 roll, the player that rolls the highest goes first, and then it goes clockwise. So it's not D&D rules, it's not modified by your decks or anything like that, just a D20 roll. But it does introduce that concept, which is, and, and enforces the taking of turns, which I do appreciate. Now, when it's your turn to act, you're going to pick 
one of your attacks to use. So you have your special ability, which may or may not be an attack power, and then you're going to have three attack types. Every character has a basic attack that hits easily and does one damage, a more difficult attack that does two damage, and a special attack. Now, to use your special attack, this brings in that improv element again. You are required to describe how you make the attack, and then it will tell you what you should use to come up with this description. Now, most of them are based on the items on your backpack again, which is why that random backpack at the beginning is so important. Others, though, will say, how do you use your surroundings? For example, the druid, their special attack says, how do you use your surroundings to attack the enemy? Now, special attacks are not um, one and done. They're not, it's, it's, it's a sliding scale. So you actually have a scale of success versus the basic attacks. Now, all attack rolls are single D20. Hits cause damage to your foes, which is tracked by the DM. Once a foe hits zero, it's considered defeated. The player that dealt the final foe then, according to the rules, must describe how they defeated the monster. Again, great to encourage this role play with a special action, but then ignore everything and come down to the role. Again, I agree. So if a monster is not defeated, it counterattacks. Again, the DM is not playing the monsters in any way. They're going to roll the die, look up the result on the monster card, and tell the players what they do. Now, a good DM and players who have gotten into it are going to look at the result and it's going to say, Talon, one damage. They might get more descriptive. When we play it, that Talon becomes a whole. The monster lurches forward and scrapes you with its talons. But mechanically, it's just Talon does one damage. And if you rolled higher, maybe it's a wing buffet that does two. Almost every attack the bad guys do just do damage to your character. If you're ever reduced to zero health, you are dead, at least for now. Once combat's done, you can spend all your current gold to re resurrect your character at five hit points. Now, this is a metagame thing, but if you're playing this game and you know this role, make sure you always keep at least one gold on you at all times. I, I feel like there may be some mixed messages in that money resurrection mechanic, but I could be reading too much into it. <laughs> Now, once your group defeats a monster, everyone gets a reward. This is usually one or more gold coins each and may also be a random item drawn from the item deck. Now, after combat, players have the option of spending their gold. It costs three gold to go shopping. When you do this, you actually take three cards from the item deck and pick one. It's supposed to represent what's available at the shop. Note, there is no option to say, I didn't want any of this and keep your gold. Each item gives some kind of bonus. Um, there's bonuses, there's, there's ones that do one additional damage on any attack, there's ones that heal you, there's ones that do two damage, and then there's all kinds of shields and cloaks of invisibility that let you avoid damage. And what most of those do is they reduce the damage to one no matter how much you would take. And there's a whole handful of these, um, they tend to be rather punny. Um, the, the, there's, there's, there's some rather amusing, um, I love the, the baby owl bear in particular is exceedingly cute. Um, you can also spend five gold at any point that you have it between encounters to level up. Now, when you do this, you reset your health to 10. This is big. That's important. Watch that one. Also, don't level up too early so you can get that burst of health because there are not necessarily a lot of healing abilities in the game. You're also going to flip your weapon card to the other side. Now your attacks do more damage for every encounter going forward, and your special attack now actually has a way to earn you gold. So... Can you, you've talked about shopping after combat encounters. Can you go shopping after non-combat encounters? Yeah, sorry, that, that's me oh, boarding okay. a pad. After <laughs> an encounter. after Between encounters, before you move to the next spot on the map, which is our next session, you can go shopping. Okay, go on. So, yeah, sorry, that was me. me Because I was talking about combat, I was, had my brain in combat mode. So after completing an encounter, either type, the group then moves to the next spot on their current board. Now, at some spots along the path, you have the option to continue along the main plot line, which is always right down the middle of the map. Well, sometimes you can divert off to the side. Really weird, and I have no idea why this rule's in this game, and it confuses me, is you can split the party. So if some of the players decide to go do the side quest, everyone else just moves to the next encounter spot. And then the players doing the side quest have a side encounter, which is always a combat. Now, if a character doesn't go on a side quest, they get to be DM for that turn, so to keep them involved. But there's really nothing if two players don't go. I think just try to swap up who hasn't been DM as often. Um, now, every map board has four core encounter spots and two potential side quests. So, they start splitting the party at an early age? No good will come of training players this way. <laughs> I think they're just trying to, maybe they're trying to break the meme of don't split the party. I don't know. It's, it's the fact that only they, the players who split, get to do it seems strange to me. And basically, the only reason you do this is if you felt like you need more gold or more items. 
you're just doing it for those rewards, but you're risking taking damage, right? So it's a, it's a risk versus reward because you know it's a combat encounter. It's not going to be one of the non-combat encounters. Now, when you reach the last spot, that fourth core encounter spot on a board, instead of drawing a random encounter card, you face the boss monster's henchman. Now, these cards were set up at the beginning of the game, as I mentioned, one, two, three, four. These, I thought, were awesome because they were both a mix of combat and non-combat encounters. So despite your fighting, you know, a beholder at the end, he might set like set a trap for you. Or uh, the last game we played, I fought, fought against a dragon, and you had to get through some mist because the dragon had cast cloud kill and you couldn't get through. And it wasn't a combat encounter, so I thought that was really cool. Now, once you do get past the henchmen, you then move on to the next map. Now, I didn't really mention earlier, but items can only be used once per dungeon tile, and your special power on your character can be used once per dungeon tile. So once you move on to the next one, everything resets, so you flip your items back over, and there's no actual way to track if you use your special power or not, so you just have to remember that. Um, you're also going to swap which deck you're using, right? So every map board has a different deck, so you're going to swap that out, shuffle it, throw it into the DM thing. So a really a remarkable amount of variety and replayability thanks to the thick decks of cards and multiple end goals yes every game should feel unique in this even if you're playing the same monster or not now the game continues until you reach and defeat the final boss monster or all your characters die uh well resurrection only requires one gold you do have to have that one gold at the time or you are eliminated so this does have player kill in it um player elimination uh, the game does suggest that if you do have a player who's eliminated, just let them continue to play the DM role. Or if there's two players that have been eliminated, swap the DM role so that they get to keep playing, which is a pretty cool suggestion. And that said, though, like we've never had a character die in any of our games. And the way this game plays, like I think a TPK, uh, a total party kill, which is a term used by D&D players, the entire group dies during an adventure, would be very rare. Now that we know what you get and how to play, how about some of your experiences and thoughts on D&D Adventure Begins? Most importantly, do you think this is a good gateway to the full D&D RPG? All right, so I've taken my time on this review. Um, this game is so weird. Like, it's an odd duck, and I honestly still don't know what I think of this game for a number of reasons. They, they just it's, There's so many baffling choices here. And not necessarily bad, maybe they're good, I don't know. Um, first off, I will say this is a board game. This is not a role-playing game. This is a board game with role-playing elements. It includes a quest, a small amount of character progression, and small amount, I mean, in one point during the entire adventure, you're going to spend five gold and level up to level two, which only means you do more damage. You are amassing treasure and loot, and there is an overall story arc, as long as you take the time to actually read it. But what you won't find here is a cohesive, ongoing story or plot. There's no campaign element here. This is not a game where you return to it multiple times and continue to play the same character. Every time you play the game, you're picking a baddie to fight, you fight through the four boards and eventually defeat the baddie or are defeated. Next time you play, you pick another baddie and pause, or even the same baddie, and do it all again, maybe making new characters. There is definitely none of the Dungeons and Dragons campaign play, which is such a hallmark of the role-playing game. In many ways, similar to Cthulhu Death May Die, in the complaints we've had about that, with the, the replayability, but the lack of continuity and yes. resetting of the game. Yeah, that is the, the, the place it's furthest from being like Dungeons & Dragons, in my opinion. Now, the other thing is you're doing that, right? Like, you're, you're going to fight a monster, you're going to go through four maps, and it does sound like the game could be repetitive. Well, that's somewhat true. As we mentioned earlier, there's, I think they're 24 card decks, and on average, you're only going to go through four of them every run through. The randomness of those encounter cards makes sure that every journey is different. Plus, there's a variability in the characters, right? Every character gives you two hero options, two personality types, and two weapons. So that gives you a number of different combinations for your character. Plus, there's the fact everyone at the table is going to make different characters, which will change your whole group mechanics. For example, one of the biggest ones is if players choose to or not to have healing. Every character has an ability to heal. If everyone takes it, you're not going to have to worry about hit points much, but you're not going to have any rerolls, and that will change the feel of the whole game. Though some of those options do have less impact than others. Mm -hmm. So while a new monster and a new hero for a year, for each player may feel fresh, the same monster, same hero, but just a different special power 
may not feel quite as fresh and, and different. Right. And then there's another thing which you probably won't notice your first play, maybe not even your second play. It'll probably take you a few plays is that all of these different options really don't make much of a difference at all, at least on a mechanical level. For example, I say you get to pick which of the two weapon tiles to use. Well, the differences are the names of the attacks and what you have to describe for your special attack. Every single weapon in the game does more. You can choose a basic hit, a basic attack that does one damage on five or higher, or you can do your heavy attack, which hits on a 12 or higher and does two damage, or your special attack, which always hits for two on an 11 to 16, or hit for one and stun the enemy, no counterattack, on a 17 plus. Every single card in the game is identical for every class. Mechanically, it doesn't actually matter what you choose at all. Now, personality traits do at least give you some different special abilities. And again, role-playing prompts, there is that aspect. But again, there's some overlap. Every single class has a special ability that can heal or, not heal, or another one that's combat-based. Now, thankfully, the combat-based ones do offer some variety. Um, most of them allow you to re-roll dice. One of the neat ones is you team up with one of your, your allies, and you both roll, and you take the highest roll, which is kind of like the D&D the &D, uh, advantage mechanic. So there is some difference there. Uh, so, well, evening out the game and removing some negative as aspects of differentiation, like racial or gender stats, they have sort of overbalanced it, mm -hmm. which gives everyone a fair chance the first time, but goes to minimizing the replayability of having all these options. Mm -hmm. Despite the combinations we spoke of earlier, playing a different hero may feel fresh, but you quickly discover it's actually anything but. And to be honest, I have to credit my kids for noticing it before I did. I think mainly because they were sitting next to each other and looking at each other's character sheets that we found out that they're the same. So all these different character choices really do is to give you role-playing prompts to use when describing what your character does. Because multiple times during the game, both during encounters and when using your special attack in combat, you're directed to come up with a description of what your character's doing. Now, while this is a great way to encourage improv role-playing, none of it has any impact at all. It doesn't matter how well you describe your actions, how brilliant your group's plan is to get past the zombies, or how clever your trap is, the end result is based on a single die roll with the results dictated by the encounter card. Like your DM roll here again is not any type of arbitrator. They just tell you what the result says on the card. So while D&D Adventure Begins does a great job of encouraging freeform role playing and storytelling, there's no mechanical encouragement to do it. And this is the biggest flaw with this game. If you remove the improv elements, which you can do without actually affecting the gameplay or the goal of the game, you're left with a very dry and boring dice roller. I would go so far as to say mechanically, it's a bad game. It does nothing to reward player skill or ingenuity. There is no better way to play this game. It's all just at the vagaries of the dice. Everything is determined by the roll of the dice. Now, what this means is your enjoyment of D&D Adventure Begins is going to be very strongly based on the people you're playing with. If your group, or even one player in your group, isn't willing to take part in the storytelling and the improv aspects of the game, it's going to fall flat, possibly very flat. While the game can be played as an arbitrary dice chucker, it's just not fun to play that way at all. Though I'm sure playing through and just rolling and moving on really cuts that playtime da down, down, though. Yeah, that's why I said 15 minutes to uh, two hours for a game, because if all you do is roll the dice, move the hit point trackers, you can get through this one quickly. You're probably not going to have much fun, though. Now, what's most interesting to me about this, and this is why I find this game so hard to review, is that really, in this way, Adventure Begins is very much like the game it's based on. The full role-playing game of Dungeons & Dragons, or really any other pen and paper role-playing game out there. Your experience playing D&D is also going to be very much based on the group you're playing with and how they choose to engage with the mechanics. D&D the RPG can also be played fully mechanically. Although I think you're missing out and you're missing the point of D&D and you're missing the fun, but you can do it. And you can do the same thing in Adventure Begins. And because of that, I think it actually is a good introduction to D&D. It features a bunch of D&D tropes and monsters and encourages improv storytelling and role-playing. 
it's definitely much easier to learn to play than the full game. Like these rules are dead simple. Um, this is a game where I, you, I don't think you need to even open it and punch it before you sit down to play. Like the rule book is like six to eight pages. This is, you could all learn it at once and start playing right away, right from the box. And the thing is that you really do need to engage with the improv elements though, or you're going to miss out on the fun that's in this box. So, and that's really what any RPG should be about. Fun at the table. Yes. Now, another aspect of the game that we found after multiple plays is that there just aren't enough item cards. To the fact that I'm wondering if we're playing extreme. Between getting items as rewards from completing encounters and going shopping, every single game we played, we have acquired every single card in the item deck. Like, uh, why is this deck not bigger? Similarly, after a few games, you'll have seen all the different cards in the encounter decks. Now, the problem with this is, is there are cards in there that are, you see a uh, sparkle in the lake, do you investigate or not? Well, once you know the answer, you'll do that every time. Now, the other ones where it's, hey, everyone has to come up with a way to get across the bridge is going to work because your different groups are going to come up with different things. If you're using your prompts, you're going to have different backpacks in play and so on. But like the arbitrary multiple choice cards, you're going to eventually learn what the, the, the right choice is. And I don't know, maybe you pull those out of the deck after a while, or maybe that's just your lucky break that you know what you get. I'm not sure. So I, um, did, I did, when researching this earlier today on my own, uh, come across any number of people who were complaining about this very thing yeah. it you you go through it like you just do it's you, you're not playing extreme this is how unfortunately the game is made see what we were thinking might stretch it out is if your item reward went to one of the characters and you decided so instead of everyone getting an item when you defeat because the same thing like in D, D, monster drops one thing they don't drop one thing per character which again i'm i'm, I'm kind of projecting my D, D experience on this board game which is kind of hard for me not to do so fair i probably should have had this right at the top of the review i have played D D every edition from second edition upwards no i actually played ad and or just ad and D at least once and i did play bx once and i played white star which is based on od and D. so i have lots of D D experience so i could couldn't tell you how this game would work for someone who has absolutely no idea what D&D is. So there, there is that bias there, which I really probably should have stuck right at the top. And I think I'm going to have to add to the written review of this because I do think it's important that I am probably projecting some of my D&D experience on this. So back to something positive. One of the things I did like is the humor in this game. Um, many of the cards take a very tongue in cheek look at D and D. Um, this is almost John Kovalik um, Munchkin level of, of seriousness taken with this game. The kids thought this was hilarious in most cases. Um, in our last game, we fought a reverse centaur, which was literally the hop half of a horse, bottom half of a man. Um, one of the magic items I had the last game we played was the liar, liar, pants on fire, which was the liar music instrument that when you played it, lit people's pants on fire. Uh, the game includes a huge number of such puns. Nobody likes reverse centaur. <laughs> but also interesting to note that since this is Hasbro, there is cross-promotion. Uh, I remember seeing a My Little Pony card during the unboxing, even. Yeah, it wasn't called out specifically, but it definitely had the artwork style of that. And I am pretty sure there was a troll in there and probably some other Hasbro licenses sprinkled in. Um, my favorite card actually so far is Halfling Pirates, which the pi halflings are so short that you just see their fingers over the bow. And that's what it is, is they ambush you because they thought it was an empty boat, but it's just that you couldn't see the halflings over the bow, which I thought was really cute. Like, it, like it, it, it's it's a to a ridiculous level, but in a way that doesn't push it to, like the game's already silly. It's already pretty improv, pure improv. You're playing with anyone but adults trying to take it too seriously. Your game's probably already gone off the rails into, into uh, fantasy world and Oz more so than your standard grim dark game. All right, so since this game came out, since Under Dragons Adventure Begins was released in 2020, October, I have seen a huge variety of opinions on this game. Now, I will say the majority seem to be people that would go so far as to say they hate this game. You don't usually see board game reviewers and board game media and people who talk about games talking about hating games. I have seen people say that this is actually a, having a negative impact on the role-playing hobby, that it is that bad a game. I have to assume these people 
for one, I, I wonder if they even played it or if they just read about it. Second, they must have played it as a board game, right? Like if you are a bunch of Euro gamers, and you buy this game, even though it's co-op, you play to win, right? That's how you play Euro games. You focus and you, you meta game and you just do the most advantageous thing you can to win. But you can't do that in this game. It's, there, there, it's purely mechanical. It's just die rolls. As I said, doesn't matter how well you describe your action. It's not going to give you a plus one. You're, you are stuck with the vagaries of the die roll. So I could see people hating that aspect of it because it's not a board game in that ass way. It's, it's, it's a storytelling RPG, but it's not a full RPG. Again, I have such a hard time talking about this game because it's such an odd duck. Like personally, I don't know. I, like, it, it's definitely not for everyone, but I have had a fantastic time playing this with my two girls. We have told some fantastic stories. Uh, one of the best was we returned home to our village and found that our friends and relatives had all been turned into zombies. And the girls started right off because of it, trying to corral the zombies and try to take them out without hurting them and, and trying not to hurt our loved ones, to set traps, and eventually we locked them all in their homes. Now, all of this was just based on a card, Undead Townspeople, that had this for flavors text. Aunt Gertrude, is that you? That was it. That's all the game provided. But we ran with it. Our family was able to take that. And then after Aunt Gertrude, then everyone else was Brother Jimmy. And we, we had this whole encounter where people were climbing up trees and trying to rope up zombies and shove them in, all while mechanically rolling dice and reducing their hit points. Similarly, I've been really impressed by my kids' use of powers. Uh, the, the, the special powers, right? The ones you have to describe. So, for example, Sleight of Hand states, describe how you use trickery and the items in your backpack to attack the monster, then roll. I just expected my kids to fall into the trap of just describing the same thing over and over, right? I, I use my rope and it tangles around their feet and they trip. Next time they use Sleight of Hand, well, I, you know, I use my rope and it gets tangled on their head. And Honestly, the game does not punish you for doing that. So that's another aspect of this is that you describe it however you want. If it's the same way every time, that's fine because all that matters is that D20. But I was fascinated by the way my kids came up with something unique every time they used their power. And when they couldn't, they were like, oh, I guess I make a basic attack because they can't come up with anything good. So, of course, this will vary wildly with mm -hmm. every group of players. And at time, even in play with the same group, as someone may not be in the same verbose mood or having a bad day or just be in that different mindset. They can still play the game, but the experience may be more muted, less filled with wild tales, unless, mm -hmm. of course, you are able to use those story prompts to bring them back around into a good mood and back into the game. Now, overall, my family's had a great time playing Adventure Begins, but I know this obviously has not been the case for everyone who's tried this game. I like, we seem to be the outlier. I, I seem to be one person who's, who's praising this game in a way. And the main problem though, is because mechanically it's a huge dice chucker. Like it's not even a push your luck game. It's just throw the dice and see what happens. And if players try to play this like a traditional game with a focus on winning, it's not going to be fun. You have no control over the dice unless you're cheating in some way. You use the dice in the game, they seem pretty balanced. Like, while the game does prevent tons of options for storytelling, and it says, like, if you defeat the monster, you have to describe how it's defeated. I, not everyone's going to do it. And that's where they miss out the fun. It's that improv role-playing freeform experience that makes the game so much fun. Like, the game just would have been better, though, if they did something, but then you're adding in arbitration and you're adding in pressure to the DM to come up and react. But like, I just feel like, uh, I don't know the thing. It'd probably be good if you house rule it at this point, but as the DM, I, I think the reason they didn't do this is there's, there's no pressure because there is a big meme out there. And I'm not talking about a pretty picture, a big meme out there that DMing D and D is hard, which I don't think is true. But it's out there and everyone, oh man, you're the DM, you do all the work and you do all that. And I think this was done to stop the DM role from being intimidating because all you have to do is read what's on the back of the chart. Now, as for being a gateway to D&D, &D, I think it can work as that, 
as long as you take advantage of the whole role-playing elements, as long as you actually are playing characters, make sure you're all describing your special attacks, saying what you do in non-combat encounters, not just rolling the dice to see what happens, you're going to have a and like experience. So, and for real hardcore fans, maybe once you've played a few times, you do start injecting some of those house rules to allow modification based on storytelling. Uh, one of the, 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 the problem with this game, and I think what a lot of the backlash against it is uh, rooted in, is it very much gives you a, everyone gets a participation badge feel. Mm. Um, everyone is the same. Everything is equal. Everything is balanced. No one gets an advantage. The elf doesn't do better because they have a bow in, well, the dwarf has an axe that do different damages. Mm. And and that's great in an introductory sense, but it gets old really fast. Like yeah. after that quick introduction, you want to move on because again, the replayability, while there's all these options, your kids notice right away, wait, my sword and my axe do the exact same thing. Yeah. No, I agree. The other thing too is, I also wonder if these were a bunch of adult, hardcore D&D players trying this game out. Because I look at this as a way to introduce my kids to D&D. My kids have role play. We, we started with Mermaid Adventures. We played Tales of Equestria. We've done some improv type stuff. This is not their first role playing experience. They, they understand what role playing is. But to me, this is their first Dungeons and Dragons experience. And it feels different from the other games we play. And I think that it is a great sign that it's an intro of D&D, that after our first game of Adventure Begins, both girls are like, all right, so when can we play the full game? Like, when can we play Dungeons and Dragons? This was fun, but we want to play Dungeons and Dragons. They want me to start running 5th edition. I'm like, kids, I haven't even read 5th edition. Like, yes, I mom and dad used to play D&D, but it was a long, well, it wasn't that long ago, but it was long enough time ago. Um, I'll admit, I'm slightly tempted to pull out 4th edition, but it just feels weird feels wrong for some reason though no logical reason i can't go back to an older edition but that to me i think would really like to play and then um as deanna's pointing out in the chat what my oldest wants to do she wants to play od &D. she wants to play great gygax and arneson and learn the roots and we're like no nah, you don't really need to go back that further the, the things have progressed i am sure there are people out there that will probably send us comments about why the original editions are better but fair enough uh, in a way, some of the pure improving and rulings versus rules is present in here, except it's just arbitrary and none of it matters. So, so I, I do think that's awesome. And like, like this game, if the goal of Hasbro was to get a new generation or kids excited about the world of D&D, it worked for us. Like it did exactly that. So in that way, I, it worked. So, um, mission accomplished. But, uh, and also I do want to point out, uh, one thing I was noticing, uh, specifically in Amazon based, um, comments and reviews, they, the branding on this one may have actually caused a lot of the hatred because they used adventure begins. There does seem to be some people who have assumed that this is part of the D and D adventure system for games. Okay. Um, and people are, are asking, you know, hey, does this, is this a, a way to get into the Adventure System board games? And they're not. <laughs> nope. This is this is very different. This has nothing to do nothing with D&D &D Adventure System board games. Uh, and, and there does seem to be some brand confusion based on Fair. this is a board game that has adventure in the title. Adventure begins. Uh, and so I think they may have added some brand confusion in here, unintentionally probably. But mm -hmm. that, that may be some of the hatred for it. I think another aspect could be people expecting starter sets. Like I've reviewed and talked about many RPG starter sets. I love RPG starter boxes. This is not an RPG starter box. This is a board game to get you used to improv role playing in the tropes of D&D &D and the monster names and things like elves and bards and stuff like that, right? This is not, there, there's no book, there's, you, I don't know if anyone noticed yet, but there's, the only thing you ever roll is a d20 as a player and a d10 as the DM, right? You don't even get a full set of polyhedrals with this. This is not an intro box, intro adventure for D&D. &D. And that's the other thing, by calling it Adventure Begins, it sounds like 
it might be a solo adventure or a one-shot adventure. And it's not. It's a board game. All right, before we wrap up things tonight, um, I hate to have to do this, but I feel I need to take some time to mention production issues with this game and significant problems with customer service. So as I noted at the top of the review, my copy of Adventure Begins was missing the green elf miniature. After discovering this, I attempted to get a replacement piece. Now, being a Dungeons & Dragons game, the first place I went was Wizards of the Coast. They own the Dungeons & Dragons brand. After finding the right contact page, I waited three days to be told by Wizards of the Coast that they do not handle component replacements for this game and that Hasbro would have to take care of it. Fine. I then contact Hasbro at an address that the Watsi email provided, waited another couple days and got an email stating this is a Dungeons & Dragons game. All Dungeons & Dragons games are held, handled by Wizards of the Coast. Uh, many other people stopped at this point that had similar problems. This was the end of the line for them. Now, I didn't give up. I, I was frustrated. This was a gift for my daughter. This was not a review copy. Wizards of the Coast did not send it. Hasbro didn't send this. It's something we purchased with our own money and gave to my daughter for her birthday. So I didn't give up. So I kept searching for the game, and I eventually found the game on a Hasbro gaming page. Now, Hasbro gaming is a separate from Hasbro. It's a sub-department of Hasbro. Once I found the Hasbro gaming page, I actually found a place where with a missing damage component form filled that out. This was the final correct answer. And we'll toss a link to that proper place to contact in the show notes, though I don't know how much that'll help. Because after a couple days, I heard back from Hasbro gaming and they asked me all kinds of details. They were looking for these numbers. They were looking for these specific numbers. Supposedly every game from Hasbro gaming is stamped like, uh, ingrained into the box some kind of production date and number no like i anyone wants to take my copy they can look at it for hours you're not going to find it um should have been stamped on the box sure i checked a couple other hasbro games i have and yes sure enough they do for some reason this game seems to like no one knows what to do with it so what i did do is i tore the par box apart i found like 18 different numbers on this box and i sent them all of them some of them are on the artwork for the 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 binding for the box so there's all these numbers. I sent them all of them. They just wrote back and said, we're good, thanks. All right, a week, two weeks later, I don't remember how long it was. It wasn't like the next couple of days. This large package shows up at my door. It doesn't say who it's from. I'm expecting it to be a review copy of something I agreed to review, though I had no idea why. It sounded like Lego, like it had that, that shifty. I'm like, I have no clue what this is. I open it up, and I find Monopoly Fortnite Edition. I'm like, what? I have not and would not agree to review this game with anyone. There's no way. I am not a Monopoly fan. I know next to nothing about Fortnite. My kids don't play Fortnite. Like this is this is like the exact opposite of anything I would possibly want in my house. Packaged with it, I find a note from Hasbro Gaming. It says, "We're happy to provide you with the enclosed replacement product part." I'm sorry, Monopoly Fortnite is not a green elf. So I contact customer service again. This time they dismiss me, like complete dismissal. Sorry, this case is closed. You should be happy because we sent you a brand new game of equal or greater value than the one with your missing component. They've closed the case at this point. I can't respond. I can't even follow the link. It redirects me to the customer service page. Like I am not happy here, right? Now, had they written back and said, we're sorry, we can't replace your elf. We don't do replacement components for that game. Return it to where you bought it, because that's what I recommend anyone else do that has this problem. Ship it back to Amazon, bring it back to your local game store, go to your Walmart, go to your Target, and bring it back. If they had said, sorry, we don't do it, you'll have to return it, that would have been fine. I would have been frustrated, it would have been annoying, but at least that's understandable. If they'd said, we can't help you, but would you be interested in another one of your games? Again, I would have been frustrated, but that would have been fine. But to just send me a copy of a random game from their collection and claim that's my replacement product? Like, even if the note in it had said, we're sorry, we couldn't replace your elf, but here, have this copy of this game that has a higher value. No, it didn't. It said it was a replacement part. So after all this, which at this point is closed, there's nothing I can do. I have a copy of Monopoly Fortnite that's going to be in our extra life auction this year because I'm not opening it. After this fiasco, I go on Board Game Geek, right? And I discover I am not the only one who has found production issues with this game. There are a large number of people reporting broken or missing miniatures, missing cards, and missing D20. Interestingly, every single one of the people have reported they gave up. 
they never got re- resolution. Um, most of them got so far as the runaround, where Watsi tells them to talk to Hasbro, and Hasbro tells them to Watsi, and they gave up. So what I did is I went in and I gave the proper link. So I don't see what they're going to get out of it because I wasn't able to get Maybe they'll all get copies of various versions of Monopoly out of it or something. So I mentioned this here as a, a caveat emptor, right? Buyer beware. If you are thinking of picking up this game, you may end up with an incomplete product and it seems like there's a zero chance Hasbro Gaming will do anything to fix that problem. Uh, Again, if you do pick it up, I recommend returning it to the retailer you got it from. Just a, a quick uh, search through Amazon reviews today had me listing uh, completely missing decks of cards, um, a box that was completely intact with the internals completely crushed, uh, missing miniatures, and not just the elf. You know, different yeah. people had different miniatures missing. Uh there is definitely a QC problem at the manufacturing assembly portion of this product. And it looks like they don't stamp their box, so they can't trace back their problems, so their QC is terrible. Yeah. Like, I, it's Hasbro. Like, I expected significantly better. And I expect the other thing, too, is like, I tagged Wizards of the Coast on this because I'm like, do you realize? Because everyone thinks this is your game, it, it's D&D. Heck, it says Wizards of the Coast on the box. I can see it right there next to the UPC code. Like, Hasbro is getting you a bad rep. Wizards of the Coast actually has a really good rep for customer service. It's getting trashed because of this game. Well, when you've got a chance, be sure to also check out our written review of Dungeons & Dragons Adventure Begins, a cooperative board game over at TabletopBellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we've played since last episode. All right, I've actually got games to talk about, like actual physical games that we played on the game table downstairs. So I got Machi Koro, Bright Lights, Big City first. Uh, this was, and still may be actually, a Target exclusive version of Machi Koro that includes cards from the base Machi Koro, as well as some of the cards from the two main expansions, uh, Millionaire's Row and The Harbor. Now I've heard that this is the best mix of cards version of machi koro now i this came out before the anniversary edition so that might be better and i do know there's a machi koro legacy which people on twitter are telling me is way better so but legacy games something totally different for base machi koro i've heard this is one of the best so i've been looking forward to trying this one out uh, mainly to compare it to space base and valeria card kingdoms now, right up, I'm going to say the same thing about Machi Koro as I did about Space Bake a couple weeks ago, and that is when compared to Valeria Card Kingdoms, I am impressed that despite being based on very similar mechanics, the basic mechanic of roll some dice, get some stuff based on the cards you have, then use that stuff to buy more cards to put in front of you, each of the games plays very differently. So uh, it is still exclusive. I'm looking, okay. and, uh, and it, it is not available in any of the other retail outlets at this point still. Um, Fair enough. Does it hog the table as much as Space Base does? I would say even more. Wow. The difference is that it's not at the start of the game. So one of the things in Space Base is you start with all the numbers in front of you from 1 to 12. So And cards for all the numbers in front of you from 1 to 12. This, you only start off with two numbers. So this is actually similar to Valeria, right? With Valeria, you have your knight, and that's it. While this, you only start with two cards and two low numbers, which actually can be a bit of an issue uh, because, like, our first game, we went six rolls before anyone got anything or could buy anything. Now, I will note, we were playing a bit extreme because we misunderstood the uh, what number on the card is and the cost to buy the card. But even then, rolling fives and sixes, you may not be, have enough to buy anything at that game and you go back and forth with nothing now this was also a problem in valeria right you only have the night if no one rolls the night numbers no one gets anything but it picks up quickly like you're gonna start buying cards pretty quickly and start filling in so that you have all the numbers now another big change from the other games is you start with one die only so you roll one die you have one to six and the early buildings you have are actually a two three and a three i think they are or a two three and a one so you have you, half the numbers should generate something now, later in the game, you can build a building, uh, specifically the harbor, that gives you two dice. And then later, you can unlock a building that gives you three. But when you have three dice, you actually get to pick two of the three to use. So you're only ever using a maximum of two dice. And unlike the other two games, you're adding them together no matter what. So there's none of the Valeria where you get the number and the other number and add them, or you get the pick. So not two and three or five, 
just five. Right, just five. If you roll a two and a three, you have a five. Now, similar to Space Base, this version provides a variable market. Um, what I like here is they actually split the cards so that their numbers one to six and cards that are seven or higher. So you know, like, if you can't roll two dice, you're never going to roll seven or higher, right? So don't buy any of those cards until you've unlocked two dice. I do like that. Um, now, the other thing I found that set it apart that really made it feel different from the other two games, and this is what, what, what if you like this aspect, you may want to pick up Machi Koro to the three, is that this is very much a screw your neighbor, take that kind of game. Machi Koro has a number of red cards. Every single one of these is take gold from your opponents. Uh, in specific, it's whoever rolled the dice. So whoever's turn it is rolls the dice, and if you have a red card in that number, they're going to have to pay you before they produce money. Now, also, there are purple ones. Now, purple cards are monuments. They're very expensive. But what they do is they go off on your turn and have everyone else at the table give you money for something. So it takes money all the time. So what it leads to is a huge amount of back and forth and money changing hands. So there's only the one resource in the game. There's money. There's, it's not like there's power and magic and all the stuff in Valeria. Or Space Space just has the one resource. This is one thing. Money, and you actually use physical tokens in this one. Um, because you can save your money up turn to turn. And while what's interesting is because of all the take that cards, there is a high chance you're going to lose your money on the off turn. And there's a good chance it'll get stolen. Of course, depending on what your opponents built. If they haven't built any red cards, you got nothing to worry about. Um, so you kind of want to spend all your money every round. So that's an interesting, like, a meta game, like, like something that's forced, a, a di not divergent play, emergent gameplay aspect of it that you notice pretty quickly. Uh, now, my final observation I do have is the fact that our first game took us over two hours. Now, the box says this is a 30-minute game. That's way off. That's like quadruple the time it says it should take. And I think the problem here is that it's not really meant to be played two-player. Because all it meant is we just kept passing our money back and forth. Like every red card affected the other player, and every purple card only affected the other player. So a bit of that Monopoly endgame problem where the economy becomes a closed loop and there just is no endgame scenario almost. Yeah, and just like if you'd save up, right? Like you're like, oh, I've almost got enough to build the final thing that cost me 30 gold. And then you roll the number. It's like, oh, it takes half your gold rounded up. No, here you go. Have 15 gold. So I got to say overall, this is my least favorite. Of, of these three rolling resource, rolling resource games, whatever you want to call them, Machi Koro, Space Base, and Valeria. But I'm still going to hang on to this one uh, because we're in the middle of COVID. We're limited to playing with only two people right now. So I want to see how this plays with more players. And this is also one I want to throw to the Sean list. So when you come down, I'd like you to try this to be able to compare it, see what you think versus Valeria. Yeah, and now I cringed when you mentioned the take that aspect, but it also sounds like it's not that big a deal if you manage your money right. So it's mm -hmm. not as cruel as, uh, as say, something someone might pull on you on uh, in unfair. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, definitely, one of the, the, the timing is very important. The red cards happen first. So you have to give your money before you've generated money. So if you don't have any money, the opponent doesn't get any. But then those purple cards that affect everyone happen last. So they're even worse. So it's it's kind of a toss-up between both. All right, up next, we finally got to try the Quacks of Quedlinburg. And yes, you all know this already, but man, is this game good. Like, this is really good. Um, what I want to mention here, though, is just how different this game was from my expectations. So this is a game that came out before COVID hit, and I'd seen it out at a handful of local gaming events. And every time I saw people playing this game, it was loud. Like, this is a game with people pulling things out of bags and shouting and cursing and groaning and cheering. And watching from the sidelines, I not knowing how the rules worked, I had no clue what was going on. Like, based on the reactions of the people playing, I thought this was more of a party game. Like, a, a very random push-your-luck game. More like a, a typical push-your-luck, like, like Dead Man's Draw or Liar's Dice or, or even Yahtzee or Roll For It where every pull from the bag, you're pushing your luck and potentially going to bust or, well, explode in this particular version. What I didn't realize is just how tactical and strategic it is. While playing quacks, quacks, sorry, you should know exactly what's in your bag. There's only one ingredient out of all the different types, the cherry bombs, that can actually cause your pot to explode. 
And you start off with those in your bag from the start of the game. And if you're paying attention, which you really have to be if you're playing well, you know the odds every draw of what your odds of drawing that three white. There's only one in your bag. Or the two cherry bombs. There's only two in your bag. Or the one cherry bomb. There's only four in the bag. This means at the start of the round, everyone's going to get to pull a large number of chips before any chance of explosions. Even at the beginning of the game, you've got to draw three or four of those in a row before you even have to worry about pushing your luck. Like really it's more about trying to build your bag. So you get some interesting combos and not having to worry about the explosions. It's only after multiple pulls that that pusher element luck comes into play. And it is perfectly viable to literally play it safe. Once you get to the point where you know you could draw that one cherry bomb to blow you up, you could just stop. You don't have to push your luck. But when you do push your luck, you should know the exact odds of your pot blowing up. And this isn't like complex mechanics. It's like, I know there are seven chips in my bag and two are bad for me. So unlike take that, push your luck is something I'm growing more and more endeared to with my regular games of Can't Stop and Rally Man GT. Yeah. While it's not something I want in a heavy game, it's a really fun mechanic in lighter, faster games. And then, to be honest, this almost gets to that level of heavier game. Because all of this makes the game much more engaging and deeper. Like I, like I said, I thought it was a very highly random. I thought it was all about pull them out and see if you explode. Like this is less randomness than Rally Man. Like you are definitely pushing your luck from the first die roll. Technically, your first three die rolls could all be um, whatever they are. Or if you accelerate on that first roll, you could technically blow up, well, blow up. You could wipe out on your first roll. It's not like that in this, right? There's more strategy and depth here. And then there's the fact that you may also have ways to remove cherry bombs for your pot. Uh, when we play, we use the, the, the level one books and the orange, uh, the mandrake, the or yellow. Whenever you drew that after a cherry bomb, it puts the cherry bomb back in your bag. So, like, the odds of exploding get even lower. And you can plan your bag around that, right? Like, if you're so worried about it, you can make sure to put in lots of mandrake. Or, uh, I think it's mandrake. And the other thing, too, is in this game, you have a potion. And it goes on your player board. At any point when you're pulling, you pull a cherry bomb, you can flip your potion to put it back in. Now, you use it up. It's gone for the game. But there are ways to unlock it that isn't too hard. I'm not going to get into that here. This isn't meant to be a full review. But there are lots of ways to mitigate the randomness. And really, the main point here is this is not a party game. Like, this is not what I thought it was. And even more so, Deanna was dreading playing this. And I had no idea. I had no clue that she was not looking forward to this because she thought that it was this, like, Rasha's party, push your luck. No, Deanna is all about having agency in a game. And honestly, you have complete agency in this game up to that point where you may blow up. And then it's totally your choice. Do you push your luck or not? And I love that you can play the game without doing it. Now, even more impressive is that how involved players do get. You do get that party game. Oh, I pulled a bad thing. Or, oh, I'm so close to blowing up. I can't just... Ugh! You know, you get that stand-up kind of on-your-feet kind of excitement, which is really impressive. And then one of the things that someone noted in the chat room that also was nice about this game, busting isn't that bad. You either get points or you get to go shopping for ingredients. Everyone who doesn't bust gets to do both, but it's not that bad. It's, oh, well, I didn't add some new ingredients to my bag this turn. Or I didn't earn those two points in the first round of the game that you got. Oh, no, I'll have to catch up later. And then there's a whole catch-up mechanic with rat's tails. It's just really way deeper, more engaging a game than I thought it was going to be. All right, well, now one thing I did this week was following up on a mention of a Supers game I hadn't seen before. Mm. I sat down to learn about the Mini 6 system, and with it, the Mighty 6 Supers game. Uh, which is, uh, so the Mighty 6 is a add-on that requires the Mini 6 core rules. Okay. Now, <laughs> this game got kind of frightening fast, really? and unnecessarily so. Mini 6 actually seems like a great system. Uh, pretty simple, with rules and intro done in seven pages. For instance, the recommended combat method, they have two different combat methods. The recommended one is one column of a full double column page. Wow. Straightforward, to the point, roll this plus some mods against this fixed number and calculate your damage based on yeah, you know, see, other values. 
I've heard of Indy Sits, and that's what I expect from it. it <laughs> it's supposed to be a really simplified version of the West End Games D6 system. Yeah. Which is awesome. Like, rules light, super simple, should be great for doing super. Yeah, it's funny, actually. Um, what I didn't notice initially, like, this is how thick the book is. Yes. The book is that thick because it's actually printed twice inside this. This Why is actually two twice? copies. For some reason, they actually split the book, and I have a second copy halfway through the book. Um, I That sounds like a printing error. I'm sure error. it's just a printing error. I didn't pay any <laughs> extra for it. It's fine. It's, it doesn't... Harm me Just and cut actually, your book in half. You exactly. If I, if I cut my book in half, someone else can have a copy <laughs> of Mini Six Core Rules. Uh, but, you know, again, that's, you know, this is how thick the book is, and that's twice the Core Rules, and that includes all the magic, all the vehicles, the, the, the equipment lists, you know, uh, pretty much everything you need to play everything except Supers in it. Uh, and wow. it even goes on the way to Supers, because there are quirks in there for X-Ray Vision built into oh, yeah. the Mini Six game. Now, for those of you listening, not watching, it's about a quarter inch, I would say, thickness. Yeah, if, if that, yeah. If that. <laughs> so, the same combat system in Mighty Six, which requires the core book, remember, right. took four double column pages. Oh. <laughs> and while there is more art in Mighty Six, it's not actually in the combat section. Uh <laughs> Now, one interesting aspect is that the number of optional rules in uh, Mini 6, it, the system is really well designed that way. So they give you this base system. And then at the back of the book, there's two, maybe three pages of, here's some optional rules that you can include in your game if you want to change things up. Now, okay. one that is specifically recommended right up on the first page of Mighty 6 is the dice limit. In order to avoid rolling buckets of dice... Each die above a set limit decided by the table becomes a plus three. So, now to quote the exact example given in the Mighty Six book, 412D plus one becomes 5D plus 1,222. Okay. Sure. And you, you might think... What a silly number to use. But no, wait, it's actually not. Because Mighty Six is a completionist system. And it scales so that if you want to have Aunt May fight Galactus, you can. Or, for even more dice, you can have all of the Avengers fight Galactus. And each applicable power added adds more dice to the pool on an action. Okay. So, of course, what that means is that the dice pools are ridiculous. And unless you're running on a virtual tabletop, <laughs> utterly impractical. Wow. But like, when... I thought Shadowrun and some of the classic games, I've, I've heard of games with buckets of dice, but not 412. <laughs> 412 D6s. I don't even think I have that many of my O's. I have a lot of D6s and you have a lot over of a lot of games. <laughs> now, when someone rolls that 5D plus 1,222, you'd better hope you have the powers to soak damage and the armor to soak damage because PCs don't have more than 16 wounds and NPCs seem to average more around 8 for your generic villain that you're going to be battling, even less for like a thug. So wow. you're 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 rolling, you know, five d six plus one thousand two hundred twenty two, and sixteen damage is a death ball. <laughs> so this this sounds like it's actually Final Fantasy, the role playing game. <laughs> Once you get up to higher uh, levels, I mean, at least they don't have MDC and SDC, but that's but a whole fair. different. Oh, uh, wow. Now, what I have to say, while I guess I have thrown a lot of shade at this at this book, there actually are some really great aspects about the Mighty Six book. Uh, for one thing, the art in it is actually great. There's some really great, like, right. comics. Not just comic panels, but actual comics in here that are really fun with a great sense of humor. Um, there's a selection of comically tweaked ads. So those mm. those ads you used to find in old comic books where, you know, buy your X-ray goggles or get a mm -hmm. one-person submarine. They've taken yeah. those and modified them in added... Uh, added humor based on what the, those the silly pictures actually were, and, and made them superhero right. based, uh, and it's fantastic. 
And once you get your head around the size of the numbers, again, the system is still pretty straightforward. Um, it's a little overwritten, I find, and that's, that's sort of why the book is, is so giant, uh, as well as the needs to get all the powers in there. Because again, crunchy system, completionist, you have to find your own power in the list of powers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, sadly, <laughs> because of that, it's 164 pages on top of this tiny little mini core book. And the, the problem with those 164 pages I discovered was that it was not ever laid out for print. I purchased a soft cover book as was, as the option was, because I prefer to have a, a dead tree in my hands when I'm reading an RPG, but it was very clearly laid out for PDF and never a thought for gutters was given. That's not and of course, the final complaint, and this is something I know you were noticing when you were lo doing some research for the print version of my article on, on Supers. Um, stop using Comic Sans as a font in print. It doesn't. Comic books. It doesn't work. It but it really, says comic in the name. It really doesn't work. I don't know what confuses the heck out of me about this is it sounds like they took the super rules light distilled down to its basic system and built it up to be possibly even bigger than the original system was built on. This sounds more complicated than West End Games' full D6 system that's used in Star Wars and Ghostbusters. Like, I, 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 it's like they, I don't know. I, I don't understand the obsession for that. Like, like I, someone, again, it's it's very it because of what they've done and all the effort they've put into it. It is very completionist. You know, you and you wow. can create these really complex interesting characters by and and this is another thing that they they did is so perks are are the thing but they took that term and so it's like powerks and powerks. They, they they made everything a, a a sound pun with perk um so everything you you add into your character is is a powerk or a perk or a wow. twerk or a it, yeah and that gets annoying but that's that's easy to overlook you can just ignore that um, so Dana oh. mentioned something in chat. Is there a chance this whole game is a joke? Like, is it all tongue in cheek? It doesn't seem to be. I mean, it seems to be okay. like you know, it, it's the comics are comicy. They're fun. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's you know, a bunch of guys. The, the stuff that you and I would sit around and make jokes about, and you know, sitting around mm. and playing things uh, as a as as the comic part of of it. Um, but no, it's it's a system meant to be a real <laughs> system. All right, with those numbers, I thought maybe. It just meant to be a look how ridiculous we no, get. No, again, it's it's you know you need to be able to do Ant May versus now. Galactus. So Ant May rolls three d six and Galactus rolls five d plus one thousand two hundred twenty two. Um, that's that's staggering. <laughs> All right, interesting. I don't. I, I doubt you're going to be trying to get that one to the table anytime soon. <laughs> Maybe something else with mini sticks. I wonder if it's worth picking up a different mini six system just to see what. I think. I think running a it. fantasy mini six just out of this book yeah. would probably be fun. There you go. All right. Last game for me is um, we played some Adventure Begins. D D Adventure Begins. Uh, this time we took on the Green Dragon Death Sleep. Uh, we talked about this plenty during our review segment, so I'll keep this brief. Um, now, the biggest problem with this game, besides the fact people can play it mechanically, which isn't a problem with my girls, is the lack of item cards we mentioned. Uh, this was very evident in our last play. We were doing very well in the game, getting lucky with the encounters that gave us items along the way, so we didn't feel the need to do many side quests. Um, like, there are two options per board to do side quests. We did one, and that's it. So we only did one side quest in the core quest, and we still ran out of items on the third board. Not the fourth board, and that's playing with three players, not four. Like, that is way too short. Plus, we also had a ton of gold at the end of the game, which means nothing. Like, once you've leveled up and the item deck's empty, all your gold matters is that you can resurrect. And again, as I mentioned in the review, you only need one. Now, I was thinking it might be an interesting way, like, if they had just put a score sheet in the back. How much gold did you bring back? Are you a popper? Are you a hero? Are you a king or something? based on how much gold your group had at the end, there might be something, but that's not included in the game. Like, I have no idea how well this game is doing for Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast. Like, I see the reviews from, from influencers, but influencers tend to be alpha gamers, right? They're people who take the hobby very seriously, and they don't seem to enjoy this much. Maybe mass market, this game is blown up. I don't know. But what I would love to see is expansions. 
Like it'd be so easy to put out new maps, double sided. Why aren't the maps in this double sided? It would have been so easy. Of course, they would have had to include more cards and more baddies and more hero options. And while most importantly, more items. Like they don't even have to put out like a big box, right? A just little mini expansions, small packs, right? Give me one new character with a miniature, a D20, and the tiles. It may be a standee so I can play more than four players, but I don't think that you need that necessarily. Or or give me a new monster, right? Give me a new player board, a new standee, a new deck of cards, a set of three new henchmen, and we're good to go. Or just like an item pack, right? Just give me another deck of items. More backpacks to give other things. I'd actually like something other than backpack. Like with the backpack, throw in something else you can improvise with. Like non-combat equipment or something. I, I just, if they do do this, I do hope they increase their quality control. Yeah, with 1,600 reviews on wow. Amazon, I think it's probably doing pretty well for them. Especially since they aren't spending any money on quality control. Yeah, definitely not. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right, well, I'm hoping. We, we gamed last week, so I'm going to hope to keep this gaming streak going. Um, one of the games on the top of the list is we need to get Techlandia played. We've held on to that longer than we probably should have. I was kind of hoping COVID would be over and we get to play it out in public, but we'll at least get a two-player game in there. Um, we did release the unboxing video on this past Monday, if you do want to check the game out. That's live, so we got to play it, though. Um, we do need to get Crisis Protocol played. I don't know if that's going to happen necessarily in the next week. Uh, but more than that, I really want to return to Quacks of Quedlinburg and Space Base, or both. I, I would love to give give some more plays on those. But we do have some piles of obligations. The other thing I should have did, I should have thrown this in the announcements, is um, we've also been featured on a new, well, it's not new, it's on their 14th episode, but <laughs> new for us, uh, we were featured on another podcast called the What You've Been Playing what you've been playing Wednesdays, which is part of the Cardboard Conjecture podcast, and it's a number of us Canadian podcasters getting together talking about what we played in the last week, and I would like to keep it up and have something to say next week, which I'm good for this week because I'll <laughs> recap kind of what I said above, but not, 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 not in so much detail, but I would like to keep that going as well. So you know what? We got to remember, and we'll put a pin in it to uh, add that to the announcements next week that we are now taking, where I am now taking part in that every week and give them a shout out because the, they do all the work in the background. I just upload an audio file once a week. Sean does some nice quick editing and puts some bells in and stuff. But So that's that's a good one. Uh, interestingly, uh, I could actually play Techlandia with you. I have played, sort of, I started a game of Techlandia uh, because it's on Tabletopia. Okay. Um, so they, they, they had a link on the Kickstarter as I was doing some research on it while for the, uh, for the box art when I was doing the unboxing. Uh, and I sat down and started playing with it. And I'll, you know, we'll, you and I can talk about it uh, at another time. I'm not going to talk about that now. But uh, as well as that, uh, I've got Worldwide Wrestling now in the house. Nice. Uh, and I've started reading that. So uh, I should have that done by next week. And also I picked up a copy of Blades in the Dark uh, as a read through. Uh, that's just something I want to I wanna be familiar with. And uh, I'll be working my way through those. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Sean P. Kelly of the Excellent Gaming and BS podcast, which you can watch live here on Twitch on Monday nights and sometimes on special shows on the weekends. Andrew Dacey, thank you. Diane Tuzano, up their pledge even. Thanks, Mom. Misdirected Mark. Join the Misdirected Mark team every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on Twitch. Joe Swick. Thank you, Joe. Well, well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to drop that portcullis. Though the doors for the lobby are closed, you can always find us all across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at, tabletop bellhop, at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, all the links down below. Hey, if you like the content we're providing, would like to support our continued efforts and keep us creating, please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.